Um, thank you all for being here for our topic tonight. Um, here we are, kids in the tech life balance. We do need some balance here, don't we folks? Uh, my name is Kim Porter. I'm the executive director of Be A Part Of The Conversation. Uh, we were with you all a few years ago. It was definitely pre-COVID because we were in person. We, we miss you, we miss being with you all, but really happy that you've invited us back. So thank you so much to the Pottsgrove School District. Um, tonight's program is being recorded. Um, you don't have to worry about your questions being recorded if you choose to submit any using the chat box or the Q&A feature. Um, my colleague Bob Lamb is on with me and he and I will be keeping an eye on any questions that come in. So um, we'll be moderating this program um, with Mike Blanche tonight, who you'll meet in just a moment. Um, but please be assured that your questions will be um, will not be visible on the recording. So you're welcome to submit those and the panelists will be able to see those. Um, so the follow-up page for this program is conversation.zone slash technology. So after this program um, is recorded and processed, it takes a little while. So by tomorrow morning, uh, the video will be available on that page as well as Mike Blanche's uh, PowerPoint deck. So we'll have that available for you in the morning along with some other resources that might be helpful to you. At the end of this program, you'll see um, a message pop up on your screen when we end that invites you to take a survey. We would be very grateful if you would take that survey. It really helps us to know if the program was useful to you, um, what was helpful, what was not helpful, what you would have liked more of, and maybe topics you would like to hear in the future from us. And we're really excited that we have a couple of more programs with you in the school district this year. Um, so we have a program coming up on March 24th with Dr. Catherine Dalsgaard. Uh, she's gonna be uh, a breath of fresh air at this time of high anxiety and worry. So less worry, more joy. She's a tremendous speaker and we're really excited to bring her to you on March 24th. <clears throat> also on April 21st, also a Thursday evening, we're gonna have our program for parents whose kids are in grades K through five, K through six, something like that. This is really and truly prevention from the parent perspective, parents, guardians, caregivers, those who have a really young child that you would like to lay the foundation for healthy uh, discussion, healthy um, understanding of how to cope with stress and things like that, how to avoid using substances, how to delay that onset of use for our young people. Um, so we hope that you'll join us for that and also pass the word along to anyone who has some young kids in the district. <clears throat> you can find more information about a lot of our programs on our calendar, that's conversation.zone slash calendar. We'll make sure to get all these links in the chat for you as well. We have these meetings that take place uh, throughout the week called Parent Partnership, and I'm the parent of somebody who is in recovery from a substance use disorder or addiction, and for the last 12 years, um, we're very lucky that he did find recovery, but I have needed my own recovery as someone who's been impacted by this. So I attend support group meetings um, pretty much every week for the last 12 years, and Parent Partnership meetings are happening mostly on Zoom these days. Uh, we hope to be getting back in person a bit more, but this calendar on our website shows you all these green buttons are Zoom meetings, the purple buttons are in-person meetings, and there's one hybrid meeting. But any of these that you click on on our website will tell you how to join the meeting, maybe there's a special topic on a certain night, so you can find all of that information there. And that is all that I have for you, so I'm going to stop sharing and say hello again and ask Mike, would you mind uh, introducing yourself and telling folks a little bit about yourself before you get started? Uh, sure, Mike Blanche. I'm the co-founder of Ethos Treatment. Uh, we have locations in Collegeville, uh, Plymouth Meeting, Westchester, Pennsylvania, and in Philadelphia. Uh, we do provide telehealth uh, therapy. I will get into that as well, what, what advantages and how we pivoted. But I've been working with Kim and I've been in prevention work for over 10 or 15 years. I've been in direct clinical for about 25 years and I've worked in all levels of drug and alcohol treatment. And in that, you know, have seen the shape and, and scope of technology kind of expand and then particularly in the last couple of years blow up. So I'll get into that when I get my presentation. I was queuing to see, is that all you just wanted me to introduce myself or do you want to have these rest of the school district introduce it? So, yes, yeah, so I'll just let you know that we have a few other folks with us today. So we're, we're happy that we have some staff from Posh Grove, including um, Liz Rakoff, who's a secondary social worker, 
We have Dr. Dave Ramage, who is the Director of Technology, and Dr. Kate Pesito, who's the Director of Pupil Services. So they're with us to answer any questions that you might have um, from their perspective, but we're gonna first hear from Mike to do his presentation, and then we'll check back in with them on the other side. And as I said, please go ahead and submit any questions you have as they come up. Um, and you, you want us to, we can ask the question as we go through, right, Mike? You don't mind being interrupted. I know you usually say that. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. Go ahead and feel free to do that as we go along. And we'll definitely get to questions at the end. There were a few that were asked in advance during registration. So we'll be sure to address those as well. Thanks, Mike. Sure. Uh, and good evening. And again, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Bob, for being part of the conversation. I really appreciate the work that they do. And I want to honor like all the, the, the amazing opportunities that are online that are available to you guys as families. So please take advantage of the resources that are available today online that you don't have to travel. That's and what I'm going to end tonight on is why technology and how technology can be really successful and connective and appropriate. Because, you know, I'm going to get into, you know, why and where it is challenging. But I, I do want to say that this isn't going to be an all bad conversation. Next, I want to thank the school district and, and, and you guys coming out, Dr. Ramage and, and Liz and Dr. Kate. You guys taking time out of your busy nights. I appreciate it. I get the school and, and, and I want to honor what you do for a living. Uh, what we've been living through in the last two years is is unheard of, and uh, and so I can't thank you, and I respect educators and and people involved in school districts because again, you guys have gone through it, and I want to thank the families for showing up tonight because you guys are showing up and taking time out of your life and want to hear about this complex topic that again has reshaped our world. We've had to pivot, we've had to jump in. We some of us some of us might be burnt out. And it's how we manage that burnout, how we're taking care of ourselves, how we are going to grow from this experience of not just COVID, but the impact of technology, how it's taken off, and how it's just kind of a part of our lives all of a sudden. And so I'm not a prohibitionist. I want to start by saying that. I'm not going to sit here and say that all technology is bad. But if you think of this, I'll bring this up a couple of times. What I want to raise the awareness to have an accurate conversation with your kids, an accurate conversation with the, you guys as a family, and to really think and be thoughtful about the language of how we talk about this complex topic called technology. And even to give you an idea, we were talking today about language with Kim, and the title of this program isn't that, you know, tech addiction or tech is bad or tech, tech life balance, you know, the, the word balance and knowing that it's a part of our lives, it's a part of their education, it's a part of who they are, uh, they are digital natives. Do you guys know what that term means? You know, kids are raised in a way that that's their life. And they were raised in a time when, I just wanna pull this up, uh, that's, it was all a part of who they were and how they are. And so when it comes to technology, they've grown up with it. That's a part of their identity. That's, we're digital natives. I'm sorry, we're digital immigrants. We're coming to this world with our own past history. We're coming to this world with our own pretense and our fears and our anxieties. So we wanna process them and talk through them and get again, a better language of, of how it's going. Two quick questions talking about technology. Can you guys hear me okay and see the PowerPoint okay? I flipped to that. We can see the PowerPoint, we can hear you. Um, you your image, your yes. camera seems to be a little little shaky, but- Yes, you're, you're... But it's settled now, I think. Yeah, yes. So, all right, great. So the first topic I always talk about, I don't know if you guys can see that, you know, is this term fuddy duddyism you know, and, and again, like the way we talk about the language around this topic still, since I've been doing this 10, 12 years, and since it's, it's gone in so many direct directions, this is one particular term I always come back to when I start with and this idea is we want to watch out for fuddy duddyism For those people who don't know what that term is, back in the day, I was raised in a house with that rock and roll music, like that music, that's going to make you use substances. And it was almost like an externalization. And my parents sounded so bizarre and so out there that I kind of wrote them off. So when we get into this tech talk tonight, it's about raising our awareness about our language, understanding why it's complex, getting a better scope of what is happening so that we can inform ourselves and inform our kids. And then we can be more accurate in, in why we need to challenge our young adults. And that's the other real deal. So why is it such a challenge? Um, where is it a challenge? And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about technology and the desensitization culture of, 
you know, foul language and what happens online. And, and, and again, you guys sent some really great pre questions. Uh, one was about bullying and how to, how to scope and look out for bullying. And I'll get into that. Uh, body image, even males and, and pornography, uh, gaming and violence and the exposure to what type of level of violence that they're in, into. Uh, how many of you guys as parents, you know, will come home and your kid will be on their laptop texting and the TV will be on the background. And it's like, that's the norm. And it's these multi-stimuli media approaches that the kids are just, that's what they've grown up with. That's what they're used to. And they're saying they're fine. And I'm gonna explain why. Uh, and, and one of which is this idea of lack of developmental conversation piece. You know, when we talk, when we open up, when we let people know what's going on, you know, conversations, communication, 87% of communication is nonverbal, tone, how I'm standing, how I'm presenting versus, you know, if I was to say, hey, I'm worried, how are you doing? Versus, hey, how are you doing? In, in, a, in a scolding tone or in a, in a questioning, non-trusting tone. And so when you're texting a kid, when you're texting your child, are you adding in that tone? Probably not. You might be sincerely saying, hey, how are you? What's going on? Are you feeling okay? Where are you tonight? I'm just a little worried. And they translate that as my mom or dad are all over me, worrying about me, and they're just up. up and and it's, it's getting lost in the translation of tonality. So I have conversations with uh, young adults and parents all the time, but we've got to look at tone. We've got to look at how we communicate and what we're communicating like. So that's a big one. Um, the next slide kind of goes into this idea where um, correlation with mental health, because again, there's a certain population, there's a certain set of population, again, that's more vulnerable to technology and the impacts of technology and folks that struggle with mental health issues. For those that don't understand in the last two years, there is a mental health epidemic going on with kids feeling isolated, feel, feeling disconnected not having resources in their home, or not having resources to, to kind of connect. So a lot of folks are at, are at more mental health risk these days. Uh, so the correlation of mental health, you know, when kids are shaming at a public level on a social media site, abandonment on a public level, meaning kids are not really talking through and all of a sudden they're, they're off their devices and they're not liking whatever you status you said. So a kid will impersonalize, not being liked or not having a follow-up conversation when how many kids get grounded and then they get their phone taken away and they find out two weeks later, they still liked each other, but their parents took their phone away. Um, this next one is a really important one. And, and this is where I see most kids get in trouble the most with anxiety and depression is the potential of re-traumatization events. I always tell the story when I had a bad day, uh, um, after my bad day at school, I would get on the bus, I would go home, and I would have process time. I would have time to think about the day. And the best news is about high school, typically, is the next day, there's a whole new drama. There's a whole new crisis going on. And each week brings a whole new dilemma or a whole new drama, not to minimize what kids are going. But today, you know, at third period, somebody took a, took a photo of it, posted it on Twitter. Somebody takes a screenshot of it, texts it to all their friends. Somebody takes a moment to then they start to re kind of and, and certain kids with anxiety get stuck on what was shared what wasn't shared and you know a lot of times you know it's also kids get refocused on or re-traumatized about exes or ex-friends or not feeling invited so so many of our youth you know especially in COVID times I didn't think I would have to talk about FOMO it was so funny halfway through COVID I learned from a school closer to Philadelphia I was like why I, I, you're all grounded you're all home you're all you know quarantining and they're like no we're not and so many pockets of kids would go out and go somewhere and share their own little story with their own friend group and so many kids felt left out and they were invited to the x party or whatever meanwhile the kid was doing the right thing and quarantining early on in this but they they felt disconnected they felt alone and again all that all that is a simple setup for this so again, when it comes to these topics, I've seen this, some of this before, but I definitely saw in COVID this get exacerbated. Uh, potential uh, relationship, obsessive relationships, importance of status updates, principle of exaggeration, 
and as I said, that FOMO story, fear of missing out for those people that were wondering what that means, fear of missing out. I call fear of missing out or FOMO kind of um, uh, peer pressure 2.0. You know, that cl classic peer pressure doesn't really exist, but a kid goes to an event where there's a bunch of kids drinking or using drugs or experimenting with certain things or doing something, they might feel that, oh, well, everybody's doing it, so maybe I should join. And that fear of missing out is I see like, you know, that classic peer pressure not existing, but fear of missing out more existing, if that makes sense. So kids with mental health issues are definitely one. Kids that have a substance use disorder, that what they're looking at is the internet is the new drug dealer, the accessibility point, medications without prescriptions, affordability, they get to learn how to do it on YouTube, WebMD to learn tactics of how to talk with a psychiatrist or block sites to learn, you know, especially like terms like uh, places like Reddit, uh, where kids can learn how to interact with certain substances or what could they take or what over the counter things. And this is where um, kids experiment way younger and are exposed to way more information. So it's important to know that with this history of substance abuse issues or history of genetic predisposition with uh, addiction or process addictions, they need to really be mindful of, of the, the impact of technology. So what has happened recently? What, what has taken off and what is still happening? Uh, the rapid increase of internet issues of 2020, March 15th, I know exactly what I was doing that day. I pivoted all four of my locations to a telehealth version. And within a series of three days, we all did trainings and learned how to create a safe environment for our programs to flip to telehealth. Um, and that was a great thing overall. But again, I, I don't know, does everybody remember where they were March 2020? You know, and since then till now, kind of the, door, the barn doors have opened up, the train has left the station, it is literally so pervasive, and I have a, a scary next slide that I'll prep you for. That's scary, but I just want to allow families to understand, like, you know, the usage of up, up, what's up, or what's app is just one app that I wanted to highlight, you know, went up five times. Uh, TikTok, you know, the algorithm be behind TikTok. How many people in here know what the For You page or what your kids' For You page looks like? And the spike of internet traffic reached its high of 70% of usage. And it almost shut down a lot of places. And I know I was doing presentations across the US where people wouldn't have strong bandwidth and it was really challenging. Um, I'll come back to this, but these are just numbers in the last couple of years. 87% of internet population, 100% of kids from 18 to 35 report online usage. Strangely, Facebook is still the leading platform. Even though I have to tell a kid what a profile picture is, you know, most times, you know, they've moved on to Instagram or moved on to other things, but it's still 60% of internet users. Um, and then this is an old statistic and I apologize. I'll, that's why I wanted to come back to it. And again, like the amount of usage, even on LinkedIn. So, so this is the scary, scary statistics. This is when it comes to average hours of using the internet, average hours for being online. Average hours for being on technology. This came out of a study. Uh, there are three independent things that I'll, I'll put on the end of uh, our, our talk tonight. Average hours of being on any type of technology. So they broke it down to um, sex and demographics. Eight hours and 18 minutes for females 16 to 24 years old. An average of seven hours and 51 minutes. And this is January 2022. This was the most updated information I could find. The average for females 25 to 35 is seven hours a day, seven hours, 16 minutes versus seven hours, 11 minutes. Uh, 35 to 45 starts to dip to a whopping six minutes and 35 seconds or six minutes and 41 seconds. It's, it's notable. 45 year old, six minutes, males uh, right at six minutes. And then 55 to 64 year olds, five minutes. Uh, on average, a day. This includes social media. This includes video games. This includes when I get into talking about all the different types of internet usage, uh, eight hours a day. And I used to actually have to walk people through on how to pull up their usage on their phones. But now there are apps that do that. And I can answer some of those apps. 
uh, like Bark is not that bad, but there is uh, basically this, this one technology piece on Apple that shows how long you've been on it for. And again, it might be a conversational piece to talk with a kid. If you think about he's in school eight hours, or she's in school eight hours a day, and then they're sleeping at night, eight hours a day. So that's eight plus eight is 16. I'm horrible math, but you know, 24 minus 16 is still eight. So th- is, are they just on their phones right out of school hours? I'm sorry. You know, they're not. They're, they're on it any chance they get in the bathrooms, walking down the hallways. And I give schools a ton of credit to manage this device because it's, it's such a big part of their existence. Um, a couple more slides around why it's a challenge and what happens. Um, and, and really get into this idea that dissonant tech time, this is what the problematic relationship is with technology. This is why I'm really worried about it, is mindless scrolling. How many people even in here on this, on this webinar have found themselves on a social media site and just scrolling and not really paying attention to what they're ingesting or not thinking about what they're, what they're reading? You know, Mindless watching of any one thing in particular, Netflix, anything. I'm not trying to throw any of the streaming services under the bus. Um, a big thing that happened um, in politics and then a big thing that happened in COVID times was watching too much news. I've had so many families and individuals kind of consuming news on a daily basis where they would be getting updates and interrupting um, uh, feeds of CNN or whatever. I'm not talking about any particular one, but in all sincerity, those interruptions and creating anxiety when you hear a buzz that again affects their ability to be present. Um, searching obsessively, being preoccupied with one corner of the world, kids and, and young adults and adults will get fixated on one aspect of life and miss so much other. Not taking uh, screen breaks or screen time and only seeing this as the only way to connect. That's a big deal. Again, I'm not saying that all technology is bad. I'm saying that when kids only see this as their only avenue for connection, that's my big takeaway. As Kim said earlier, I, I run and I deal with adolescents and young adults all the time. So translation, that means I'm used to getting interrupted. So at any time, as I'm going, I was telling Kim and the team right before that I um, usually spend a whole day on this topic. So I'm flying through some stuff. So if you have some specific questions, don't hesitate to interrupt. And next is a uh, little known fact. I try to be vulnerable in my talks. I'm sick. <laughs> so little known fact. I don't have COVID, I, I, I'm testing there, but I have an old school head cold sinus thing. And so I'm not on top of my game. So I apologize. I think I'm doing pretty good. Uh, so these are other <laughs> aspects. It's so difficult to talk about technology to do these talks. I see a little box of a couple of people in my corner, but I love giving these talks because I like interacting with an audience. I miss seeing people in person. I want to, to invite you guys to interrupt me is really what I'm landing on. Um, this is for students and, and teachers. You, you may agree with the 67 of uh, teachers observed students being negatively distracted by their mobile devices. 90% of teachers started, you know, seeing emotional challenges increase in teenagers who spent more than five hours a day and I'm trying to 71% more suicidal risk. And you saw the numbers, the, that earlier slide of seven hours, eight hours a day on average. So with kids with mental health issues, they're 71% more likely to have risk of suicide and thoughts of suicide and that feeling of disconnection. And then sleep. Sleep is a big deal. My biggest question that I ask families every day is, what's your relationship with technology? What's your kid's relationship with technology? Um, one of my favorite quick stories is a gentleman that um, actually, uh, Kim knows, had incredible anxiety and was sober, was working on himself, was a really rock solid guy, but his anxiety was off the charts. And we talked about the brain vulnerability. We talked about certain times during the day, when was it the most challenging? And he opened up and he shared that his anxiety was through the roof, 10 p.m. till about 2 a.m. He couldn't fall asleep. And then he talked about first thing in the morning time. First thing in the morning, his anxiety he kind of woke up with him. So I said, what do you, what do you typically do? What's your last thing you usually do at the end of the day? What's your first thing you usually do? He goes, oh, I, I check the internet or I check my social media or I check my text messages or I have a couple of threads going. 
And I said, that's the last thing you're doing. If you think about it, your brain is more vulnerable that time during the day as you're trying to sleep. Your frontal lobe of the brain should be kind of shutting down your decisional process making. And what it's queued up and kicked up is this, you know, text or friends or TikTok and, and this algorithm that kids are up against so they get pulled in. And when I asked him a huge favor, then the morning time, he said the first thing before he checked, before he got out of the bed, was his phone, and he would use it as an alarm. And I said, do me one favor. And I've, I've known the young man for a long time, and I had a great relationship with him. And so it came from me, the therapist, not the parent. And I said, listen, do me a favor and spend two weeks, do two weeks dive of this, cut out technology post 10 p.m., cut out technology first thing in the morning time. His anxiety symptoms dropped to like a two. He was at a 10. And what happened, what we identified is that vulnerable sleep time was getting really interrupted. His mental preoccupation of what was happening, what wasn't happening. And he got sucked in. So again, I just ask and challenge families to think about, you know, PS, you, one of my interventions I'll get to in a little bit is, you know, when you talk about how do you get your kids off your, how do you get kids off their devices? I ask parents, what's your relationship with like technology? Kids watch what you do more than what you say. So if you're struggling with it, it's okay. No shame. We all are. But it's maybe we need to recalibrate and, and reevaluate. Does that make sense? So um, I now lost my PowerPoint. Maybe one second. So I thought it was there. Sorry. Um, here we go. So um, the misinformation highway. Wait a second. I'm sorry. Um, sleep. Eighth graders' use of social media have gone up 25% are thinking more about depression and depression places. And, and again, this gets back to you guys as parents. I don't want you to blame yourself for your child's phone usage. The amount of families and individuals that I work with that are just burnt out, that, that are really trying their best, and they, we all survived COVID, we're surviving COVID, and we're trying to figure out how to move forward with this. So again, you guys are doing your best. Again, real quickly, the misinformation highway, the multiple in influence areas, TikTok, particularly the amount of algorithm behind that I'll talk about later, texting and driving, set up for impulsivity. How many times have you gotten an urgent text message from somebody and it's like, uh, if I don't get back to you, that means I'm, uh, for me, I'm a therapist, I'm in a session for an hour, or I'm giving a talk and I put my thing on airplane mode. So it's like so many people don't understand and think like, wait, you didn't get back to me five minutes ago. Wait, I'll send you another text. What's happening? What's happening? And so I work with some families and some individuals that might get 30 texts while they're sitting in a therapy office with me for that hour from multiple people saying, where are you? What happened? And my goal is to have them regulate it and have time and have not have tech time in therapy practices, for instance, in, in person. Um, and also, by the way, in telehealth, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Loss of nonverbal cues and loss of I talked about the communication piece. And again, like this is an old image and I couldn't find one with TikTok, but the amount of stimuli that the kids have been under for the last while and all the different avenues. So my big takeaway and my big ask, there was one question that a parent asked basically, I don't want you to try to follow the latest um, thing because they're gonna move to another thing. I want you to understand it, TikTok. I want you to understand certain things. But I don't want you to feel like, okay, I figured out Facebook, so we're good. Because Facebook is now fading, Instagram, all right, it's good. Now Instagram's fading, now it's TikTok. And TikTok might be here, and it might be a nemesis we'll talk about. But there are certain pieces that we can't get hooked on just the, I don't want people to get lost in the, the content of the, the app. I would like you to still think about some of the things that haven't changed, like parenting. So... To be honest, talking about parents and families, is this your family dinner table? You know, when you see everybody on their device, nobody's looking up, nobody's looking at each other's eyes. Is this your family dinner table? And if it is, I just need you to know it's okay. But let's start to renegotiate. Let's start to reclaim what our family looks like. And that's what I want to get into. Is this the modern family? Is this what everybody's seeing? Uh, the dad that's on his device while his kids are sitting around or everybody on their device and, you know, the kid's looking off and actually experiencing the moment, missing the moment because the parent is distracted by their own technology. Again, I'm not trying to shame any parents. I'm just trying to highlight, 
these kids are watching what the parents do and they're following suit. So just be mindful of that interaction. And when it comes to COVID, now I just want to take a couple slides just on COVID. Because we had this like saying going around for a while that I don't know how accurate it was, that we were all surviving the same storm of COVID. And I think that was incorrect. I think everybody experienced COVID in different ways and different times. And I think that we were all surviving aspects of the same storm of having to quarantine or having to this. So there was some universality when it came to the storm of COVID. But the biggest difference, are we all in the same boat? And the boats are symbolic of resources. You know, and certain boats have a ton of resources, certain families and certain homes have a ton of resources and some don't. And that's the biggest differential. And, and again, like a lot of folks wanted to oversimplify COVID and say, well, we're all in the same boat with this. Here we go. And I want to, again, slow down and think about where are accurate resources, where is our accurate language and really talk through. Are we driving a speedboat or are we walking through on this on a canoe? What we all experienced, though, and what we all had to deal with is some version of an ambiguous loss, the absence of presence. Everybody had to be quarantined, for instance. Everybody lost an ability for a school year. So many of our seniors, juniors, freshmen in college lost that transition year and are, are never going to get that back, for instance. But we have to kind of honor that in some hand, but know that that's a part of us, but it's not everything. And we have to keep talking through it. Um, that was a big part of what we all went through. And the biggest part of this all is about working from home. How many people in here got compassion fatigue and burnout? And, and, and I respect a lot of educators and a lot of families have tried their best, but it's really difficult when it comes to like this image of like just staring at the screen and screen time. Um, and this is like my favorite kind of pivot moment. My favorite idea is that like, the word pivot, what it actually means to me is a change in strategy without a change in vision. And, and that's the best way I know how to describe what we had to do in the resilience of working in COVID times, managing families. We had to change our strategies, our daily interactions and what we were managing specifically with technology to change the vision without changing the vision of still being parents, without changing the vision of still being a family, without changing the vision of still being an educational system as you guys are with doing the school. But we had to pivot. We had, and I, I wanted to look at the impact of technology when it comes to therapists and, and running groups. A lot of our clients over the last couple of years really pivoted well. They really jumped in and they really were just holding on to any type of group interaction. So our group retention rates went up. Our group interaction rates went up. And, and so when I saw this, I was just blown away. My wife is uh, on the board of being part of the conversation, um, Caroline Finkel, and she started... Uh, Dr. Caroline Beckham, sorry, we'll put that, I was to put that out there. But she started a program with her co-founder called Charlie Health. And it's an all online intensive outpatient for kids with mental health issues. It's nationwide. It's in 37 states in the last year. And, and what they've seen, the impact of how many kids have been isolated, need to connect. And really, you know, she did her thesis, her doctoral thesis on technology, the impact of technology in the therapeutic setting. And it just went along. That was before COVID. And, and then she jumped on this and it worked out really well. So now what? <laughs> now what are we going to do? You know, thanks, Mike. I appreciate you telling me all the problems that came along with this technology piece. But now what are we supposed to do? Reclaim your relationship with technology. You get a chance to redefine it. You as a parent, you as a family, as we're kind of dealing with aspects of sometimes quarantining still, we still need to reclaim your relationship with technology. And that can happen at any stage of development. And that can happen at any stage of life. So many of our folks think and perceive that like, well, uh, cat's already out of the bag or whatever slowly you want to say. We as a family, you as an educator, you guys, as, uh, you can reclaim how you want your kids and how you want you to really manage this. Um, one of the pieces I talk about is education and the complexity of these products and how, how they really affect everybody. And the concept there is like, talk to your kids, get your kids to open up about what they're viewing on TikTok. How many of you seen what their for you page looks like? To take two seconds on TikTok, this idea is this algorithm that's been around for a while that initially started in YouTube. And, and if you like the video for YouTube, then you would get the next video and the next video. And it was like, oh, that's cool. So it tracked. Like I was 
watching a lot of music videos. The next thing you know, I was watching my, my favorite artists and I was like, oh, this is great. And that was in 2007, 2008. And then all of a sudden YouTube retention and YouTube viewers went off the charts. And I was like, huh, how is this real? And in, in, in the next couple of years, what they did is they collated that algorithm and they made it stronger. And the next thing you know, you could be thinking about a product, you could be talking about a product. And how many of you have gone on Instagram and found, uh, I don't cook. Let me just kind of be very vulnerable. I, I am the worst. I, I, and my sister got a one of those hot pocket or not hot pocket, uh, crock pot things a couple of years ago. Everybody got one um, a steam cooker. And I was driving away from Christmas Eve at my sister's. And we only talked about it. I never searched it. I never looked it up, but it was on my Instagram feed. And I was like, yeah, so I'm going to watch my settings. And yeah, I'm going to turn off notifications. And yeah, and with kids, especially my favorite intervention with kids at this point, how many kids like being told what to do? No. How many parents like being told what to do? No. Do you guys like being told what to do? No. So it's raising your conscious consumption of what is this product? What are they doing? Why are they selling me this? And I want to raise the kids' awareness of like, hey, this is a product for me and I want to have a better relationship with it and, and have it be so it's, it's okay. Um, so really talking about the For You page. For You page on TikTok is basically when they log on, it is a catered algorithm uh, piece that again, the hesitation of a, of a link, a hesitation of what they're looking at, even the simplest thumb, how hard they, it tracks identifiable tracking behavior. So it's all about goal of LoopNet and getting kids in and on this device. It's been around since other video games, uh, video games, um, the billions of dollars that are spent on video games. Uh, everybody remembers a couple of years back pre-COVID, the free game uh, called Fortnite. Fortnite is under the same ownership of uh, Call of Duty. Call of Duty had 10 years, 10 versions of 10 different play. Fortnite itself was actually out in the beta version. They changed it, they developed it, and it took off in multi-level level use. So you can play this game, Fortnite, on this device and keep up with kids on their laptop. And that changed this whole scope of this whole thing. So the next thing you know, what they had is 10 years of data of what's called gameplay, 10 years of gamification to get kids caught up in game loops. And what do you think they would get to a certain point during the game? And they would try to see, you know, they get these three different options for three different boxes and they get to choose which box and what could be in box number one, or what could be in box number two. And the same neurochemistry that goes off in your brain when you are playing video games is the same neurological event that happens when you're gambling. So when you're gambling, think about, you know, am I going to get it? Am I going to win? Am I going to get this secret prize under box number three? And that's set up for kids for gambling. And we saw an uptick in gambling during uh, COVID, people being at home, and they, they let up a lot of restrictions, and we're not getting out of it. And as substance abuse and mental health professionals, we're seeing it more and more in our setting. So, so now what? Uh, raising consciousness, raising awareness, having really accurate conversations around what they're doing. You know, one of the favorite interventions I talk about all the time is just communication, communication, communication. I can't stress enough not being afraid to have a awkward conversations, not being able to reclaim the dinner table, not being able to afraid to have technology free Tuesdays and Thursdays, but having a real set time or set limit and being able to really communicate what's happening on their world. Listen to kids, ask them about their relationship with technology. I left in clients, I'm sorry, it was a professional talk. Evaluate their friends, talk about the risk and, and see, and so this gets into the bullying piece. You want to kind of talk with them about it and, and see what they're getting exposed to, what risks they're getting exposed to. Uh, when it comes to video games, um, the average age of an online video gamer is 34 years old. Uh, I've been doing this talk a number of years. That number is not fluctuating. So now my 20 year old nephew was then 11 when I first started giving this talk. And did I want my 11 year old, 10 year old nephew on a video game with a 34 year old. And what's that 34 year old doing playing video games with a 10 year old, not thinking just playing video games. So the at risk of that um, catfishing, 
you know, what they get exposed to, what they get sent, talking about digital imprints, talking about digital footing, talking about and educating, providing insights on regulation skills and decreasing stress around technology. Because so many of our kids are pushing, 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 they want more time, but we got to regulate it. We've got to be the parents again to regulate it. And again, learn and talk about the new games, but don't get fixated on the new games because so many come and go. You know, imagine getting a real plan, you know, creating a culture around screen time, creating a culture for talking about it, uh, providing maybe a, an initial contract or renegotiation at any time. Um, and, and the other piece around raising an awareness, what do I mean by a digital footprint? And the goals of being on um, technology, think about it like this. You know, when a kid is applying to a college, they're not thinking about what they were posting or putting on their Instagram feed when they were 10 or 11. You know, when I first started giving this talk, you know, I was talking to seniors and parents of kids that were in their senior year, and then I was junior, I was sophomore, and then I was freshman. And the next thing you know, now I'm giving talks to fifth grade centers about their first use of technology and how many fifth grade centers have technology or have their kids have their cell phones because they needed it this past year. So having kids not know what their digital footprint is like, and, and, and um, I respect schools, don't get me wrong, but I don't wanna wait for the schools to teach that. I want the families to be a part of that education, to talk about digital footprint and how they're representing themselves online. Uh, I've been, um, I've been a, a, a co-founder of a program, uh, Ethos Treatment, as well as Therapeutic Alliance, and I've interviewed folks and I've said to them, listen, you know, I'm going to have somebody do a deep dive on technology because we're in a vulnerable population and they need to know what you're, what you're like. And I've had clients come back to me and say, hey, you know, my digital presence isn't great. I wasn't really thinking about it. We'll talk about it. So it's not an exclusionary piece, but it's something I have a talk about, you know, and, and I definitely think employers do. And, and the big myth that so many parents are worried about is like admissions programs at certain schools look at it. Typically not but who do are coaches, who do look at their Instagram feed is other parents. So the amount of schools and colleges that got overwhelmed by parents calling saying, I don't want my Sally living with Susie. I saw Susie's Instagram feed and she looks like she's a real trouble. And so it wasn't like the schools took time to review the kid's Instagram feed. It was parents that were worried, it was coaches, it was places that are looking for an application for a scholarship. So those are the components. Those are the places that I let kids know. We don't know what kind of opportunities you want in your future. So we got to think about digital dignity. You know, what is digital dignity? It means integrity. It means how you present yourself on this format or how you present yourself in any format. So it is consistent, if that makes any sense at all. So, um, there's a couple other slides I want to get to, and then I want to get to the questions. Um, creating um, technology-free time, therapeutic events that don't need any technology. Live by example. Put your own phone down. Make a big deal about it. I'm cool with that. Make it a big thing. Um, so this next one is really confusing. I left this in as an education that I do for other therapists. If you Google attachment theory and the importance of feeling emotionally regulated and supportive and development, it's not an over-dependence upon this device to make you happy. So an over-attachment to their likes, to their social media presence. And that's what's really the at-risk thing to look out for. And if somebody asked, one of the questions that someone asked was, how do we know when there's a problem? When there's an over-attachment and that's their life, that's their identity, that's who they see themselves as, that's the main issue. So we want to develop other ways for them to find emotional regulation. A really great example of this, a really easy example of this, is how many people in here are standing in line in a Starbucks and you turn around and everybody in line at Starbucks pulls out their phone and scrolling through their device as opposed to having a conversation. Now, granted, we're in COVID, we're wearing masks, so we're not you know, touchy huggy today, but like, imagine, you know, no devices and somebody actually saying, Hey, how you doing? There was this amazing meme that I didn't put up. That was like, Oh my gosh, someone's talking to me in public. Who are they? They must be crazy. You know, but this is where we've gotten to. And I just want to pause and, and have families challenge that and say, wait a second, we want kids to interact. We want to learn how to make eye contact, how to talk through 
their emotions and not over depend upon this emotional regulation piece. Accepting technologies here, again, watching out for fuddy duddyism, you know, and, and, but just rolling with it and knowing that it's here and just embracing aspects of it as opposed to trying to, you know, quick to shut it down or quick to make it more of an issue. And listening to your kids and empowering them to really be in charge of their own relationship with technology. So inviting them to the table to say, hey, what do you think your, your time should be? And hey, I went to this lecture and, you know, eight hours a day, that sounds like high. What's your average? And let's look at your weekly or let's look at your daily kind of app and see what's on there it's it's on the device you can actually pull up how to how to see how many hours they're on so again it's not that we're going to have to throw this thing out uh and say oh my gosh technology is bad we're just reevaluating and recalibrating and readjusting our goals one of the great questions there was like a bunch of questions that came through was how to tie treat uh kids that have been addicted to video games or self complaint and that's a really great thing just to talk about for 30 seconds. This idea is like, you know, when it comes to addiction, you know, addiction models, substance abuse models, we talk about abstinence based is probably best practice. There is a thing called harm reduction, but for the most part, we want to think about, you know, for technology, they need it. They need to interact with it. They need to follow up on an email or a text. So to identify where their harmful relationship is, identify what their problematic relationship looks like. So to really be clear about every kid's problem with it is unique. So is it the kid that I talked about earlier that may need to shave it out at certain times during the day? And then he's only on it at certain hours of the day? That's what this young man did and he is doing great. Or is it trying to identify what uh, apps to be on for what period of time? Yes, there are good apps and yes, Bark is one of them. Um, but when it comes to, I'm not a technology guy because I worry because yes, uh, one of the other questions was, kids will learn. Kids will learn workarounds. And so I don't invest a lot of times in the app doing the parenting. I want the parent to do the parent job and know that the apps could be helpful as a talking and, and tool, but not as a, as a parenting piece as itself. Does that make sense? Um, so yes, yeah, so there's that. Um, and then when it comes to other aspects of things, let me just share the last couple of slides, this idea, um, why is it not all bad? You know, more up-to-date research, great research available to us online, instant access, up-to-date information, real-time accountability. Um, I work with a lot of families that use uh, Snapchat. Snapchat has a GPS kind of app part of it. So they'll be on their kids' Snapchat uh, to see where they are. In, in, in an invitational way, um, access to information in an anonymous way uh, to go and heal. Like I would ask somebody with a substance abuse issue to go to Barnes and Nobles and buy a book called Under the Influence, and they were afraid to run into their neighbor or have their kid kind of sell them the book. So now the kid or, or the adult or young adult can go online, get it downloaded on Amazon, sent to them, they can be listening to it. I mean, the amount of podcasts that have taken off and I love podcasts because guess what? You're not staring at a screen. You're listening and you're able to, to kind of soak in different ways of learning. And then you can be running, jogging, walking, being outside. Uh, but I love podcasts for that reason. Uh, monitoring trends and educational pieces are amazing. Gaining insights to diverse cultural experiences and global awareness. That is massive. You know, again, this is where technical support plays in and how technology is amazing. I talked about telehealth and telehealth services, ongoing tech support, downloading guided managers, uh, the amount of TED Talks that are available, the free classes that are still online, um, brought to you by the pandemic. A lot of colleges opened up that there are lecture halls that you can download and listen to lectures. University of Pennsylvania had um, their mindfulness course open for, I don't know if it's still open, I gotta double check that, but it is a, an amazing eight week course on mindfulness. They allowed it to be open and didn't charge anything for people to listen to. Uh, during the pandemic. I thought that was amazing. Online support. As Kim brought up the parent support group online in Philadelphia or to AA or 12-step meetings, uh, they're online, they're available, uh, FaceTime with family and friends and being able to really connect and see people. Um, how many of your kids are on FaceTime as opposed to calling? You know, I see a lot more uptake of kids FaceTiming each other. And I think technically that's a pretty good move 
because they're seeing the nonverbals, they're hearing people's tonality, they're getting a chance to what's happening. As a therapist, I was able to, to really, I heard about people's homes, but I got invited into people's homes via technology. So I got a chance to really see and hear when a kid said, my mom's a hoarder. And I said, oh, okay, your mom's a hoarder. And he was able to turn his camera around and show me what, in what real condition he was living life in an imitation way, in an adult way. And it worked out really well that we were able to invite the mom in and talk about stuff. But I don't know if I would have caught that if it wasn't for technology. Um, and so that's my kind of piece. And I apologize. I just hit the wrong button. That's my kind of piece when it comes to technology. And again, Kim, I've updated it. But you can see like some of the pieces were, were the same. and Some of the parenting styles are the same. Some of the important interventions, they're not changing with COVID. You know, if anything... It, we need to kind of sharpen our skill set and know and, and not give up just because we're still in COVID. We still need to really attack, be the parents that we want to be and the educators that you guys want to be. Again, it's, it's really important. So let me take two seconds at the end. And I just wanted to review the questions. Um, the first question I loved was how do parents keep us uh, kids safe when they sometimes know more than us? They know more than you. Kids know more than you. And let me just say that. So embrace that and know that and get them to educate you. Kids tell me more about things that are happening and I learn from them because I'm a digital immigrant. Uh, but again, having consistent, safe conversations, getting their perspective about what's happening, what they're feeling like, how they're approaching it, getting them to challenge them a little bit about how much time they're on, what they're on, that's the critical piece. Um, apps for parents, there are, but again, I'm, I'm pausing and saying, let's have more conversations than try to let digital kind of footprint kind of hold on kids. How to, how, how to balance technology use in schoolwork when how many excuses do I hear every day? It's like, I need my cell phone to do my schoolwork. Really, you need your, to text your friends to find out what you got for, you know, what they got on their answers, I think is more the issue. So having technology and having uh, schoolwork is important, but having technology free time uh, is really vital. Somebody asked a question, how can I enforce uh, school electronic rules in my position when it keeps most of the teachers in school do not enforce them? I'm just reading, uh, especially for students who have their schoolwork completed uh, and they're doing, um, they're going in the room where kids are not being completed in the class. At the same time, I have to be helping students who honestly want to be there. And I'm also trying to help. You guys are reading this question as well. Do, does any of the teachers? I don't know that they're, I don't know that the attendees are seeing the question actually. So why don't we, why don't we repeat that? Do you want me to just go ahead and read it, Mike, and then you can respond? Thank you. How but can I? I was going to ask if the good. teachers want to respond as well, just open it up because I appreciate you guys being. The panelists can see them, but let's go ahead and I'll read it for the participants, um, for the attendees. How can I enforce the school electronics rule in my position when it seems like most of the teachers in the district do not enforce them, especially for students who have their schoolwork completed and are doing well while they're in the room with students who should be completing work they've not completed in class. At the same time, I have to be helping students who honestly want to help, want help, but I'm also trying to keep the others off their phones, et cetera. Um, great. I'm just going to open it up first to the panelists. Do you guys want to open up at all or share from your experience? I appreciate the question. Uh, I, I don't think it's one that has a simple solution. I think it, it's partly talking with the team um, in, in the building, looking at our code of conduct, talking about our expectations. It really, it, it's, it's a collaborative effort. But I, the first thing I thought of really um, in response to that is, is a topic that Michael just talked about a few minutes ago is leading by example. And I think that it's so hard for many of us adults too, to refrain, especially if we've, if we're done our work for that particular time period, right? Um, it is a little bit of a mindless break. And do we need some parameters around that? Absolutely. But it also involves us checking ourselves too, and making sure that the expectation is, is a mutual one, if that's a fair way to say it. 
So I, I know I'm not directly um, answering that question because I think it's complex, but I, I think the most important thing is talking about that particular environment and what are the norms and expectations for that environment and involving all of the individuals that, that can be helpful in a collaborative dialogue around that. That's great. And it may not be, uh, sorry, go right ahead, Dr. Dave. No, I didn't mean to cut you off if you're going to respond. You sure? Yep. I, I was just thinking too, uh, Michael, something you mentioned earlier about pivot, right? When I hear things like this, sometimes I wonder, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a tech director now. I'm, a, I'm an advocate, but obviously I'm not such of a tech geek that I believe it's more vital than our interactions with other human beings. But I heard you, I heard you give that example of pivot. And to me, I wonder if the person would be asking the same question if what a student was doing was pulling a book out and reading a book, which is being off task in a similar way, right? But because it's a phone, we immediately jump to, we've got to get these things out of kids' hands in school. And I guess what I'm saying is I'm, I'm supporting, I agree with what uh, Dr. Presido just shared with us. It's complex, but one of the things I'd like to see is let's just keep engaging kids in the learning. You know, if they've worked ahead, outstanding. But what's next for them? It's not just about compliance. How are we really engaging kids and giving them a meaningful way to extend their learning? Or if they're struggling, give them supports to help. And it is it is difficult. But I think as a whole community together, you know, professional members of the staff, uh, kids themselves, uh, you know, these are these are conversations I had while I was a building principal with my staff and with my student leaders to talk about what does it mean to be, you know, a, a high quality student and citizen here at this school. And so I think it's interesting. Sometimes we bring extra baggage to the tech piece, which is kind of how you started with the title of being a balance. Um, sometimes we put, I think, some extra things on. We got to crack down on the tech infractions. When in reality, there's a lot of pieces involved with how we can make that whole environment a stronger environment to build our connections with each other and reach the goals that we have for our kids. I so appreciate that. I can't reiterate that sentiment uh, enough about the culture and not looking at just the to tech being bad. And we have our own reactions to it. So I think that's really important to kind of bring up too. Liz, do you want to share anything or is that pretty much what these guys said? Or you, do you, I just want to make sure if you wanted to add anything. Um, I mean, I guess I definitely agree with what they both shared. And I think just following the building expectations and even just setting your own classroom expectations of students. Um, I know in a lot of classrooms, um, even using it as a reinforcer that once kids have completed X amount of work, they can earn X amount of time on their device and maybe building it in as more of a reward instead of an expectation when they finished an assignment that then they just get to finish the class period on their device. You know, maybe it's a 10 minute break or um, something along those lines. Or I think similar to what Dr. Ram had shared, um, making sure that it's still engaging in the education and maybe related to what the topic was um, and kind of really figuring out what they were doing on their device versus just assuming that they're doing something off task. And having a conversation. That's it. Mm -hmm. and, and again, this gets to one of the other questions that were pre-sent in about, you know, um, can you share any tips for children with ADHD and recommendations of how to limit technology without a struggle? Let me just say this, it's a struggle. So there is a struggle with kids with ADHD and anxiety. Anxiety and ADHD are frontal lobe of the brain issues. Kids with anxiety and ADHD have decisional process making and frontal lobe stuff. It's gonna be a struggle. So I really appreciate Liz, you brought up the word expectation. So we gotta gauge our expectations of how much we can get across or what we're able to do in this pocket in this moment and, and again, I love that idea of limiting it for a period of time and then seeing how they do. So giving a task of a kid to say, okay, you can have it for five minutes and then you got to shut it off. And can they really shut it off after five minutes? And that learning that ability to stop the technology and then do something else, go back to their schoolwork. That's a better approach. And think about it from a muscular standpoint, a brain chemistry standpoint to learn how to manage all right, I, I really got to stay in this lane of five minutes or 10 minutes. So one of the tips I talk about with families and, and you guys as teachers, if you, if you want to add in from a school board or a school perspective, it's limiting time and giving kids an opportunity to get success at 
five minutes, 10 minutes, so that they can feel that success to build into a half an hour, to build into time away from technology. And it is just like the video game piece. It's not an overnight, one day they're going to stop playing for the next six months. It's, they may have to for certain kids. I'm not saying that. But for certain kids, it's titration, harm reduction, identify, you know, is it, are they spending 16 hours a day on a Saturday on a game? Okay, let's send two hours a day on a Saturday. And then we got to do other stuff. And then you go back. And if you're successful, maybe we'll give you an extra half an hour and see if they can manage that as more successful. So limiting exposure, limiting experiences for them to then do other stuff to have some tech life balance. Uh, Dr. Ramage, your head was nodding, but do you want to add anything more to that? Or is that kind of what you see? Just trying to give you some good nonverbals instead of, uh, since I can't be in the room, very much agree with what you're sharing. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in? You're well, you're all welcome to, or any questions. I think just along those lines, Michael, I, I often think, you know, technology is a part of our lives and, and it can be put to very good use. It's not, it's not a misbehavior, but we have an important responsibility as, as parents and as educators to teach kids those parameters and the, the social skills and, um, and all of the, the values and expectations that go along with it. So instead of it being a no, you can't have it or a yes, you can, how about we teach the boundaries to our kids? Um, just like we're, you know, we're tasked to, with teaching them with, you know, the other things as well. I think that that's an important point as well about when it's acceptable and when it's not. Right. That's amazing. As my phone dings while I'm sharing that with you, <laughs> leading by example, right? <laughs> yeah. But you didn't take your eye off screen. And I'm only using this for my notes. And, and it's funny because here's the other thing too. There's certain times where I'll tell families, I'm just using this for notes, you know, and, and I'll express like those people because a lot of people react. What's Mike doing on his phone? Why is Mike on a tech talk on his phone? So I'll tell people, I, I just have some notes on my phone. And again, it's inviting people to hear and see what's their expectation around their own usage of technology. Because again, it might be a book. What have you, Doctor Dave? Will you say something? Uh, I, I have a quick story that just came to mind when you shared that, and this was years ago. Uh, the middle school where I was, we were one to one school with iPads, and I was trying to model the use of that uh, device for my own professional work. And I can remember being in a parent meeting, and just like through the course of the meeting, which started out, I, I think I'm a pretty easygoing guy, pretty conversational, have a good relationship with parents. And as I was in the meeting, I just sensed this increased um, frustration and, and like anger boiling up. And, and finally, I, I just kind of said, you know, uh, Mrs. So -so, I'm like, is, is something, you know, what's happening? It, it, it looks to me like you're, you're, you're getting kind of agitated. Am I saying something to upset you? And she said, I wish you'd get off that, get off that thing and listen to what I'm saying. And what I was doing, and she didn't realize, is I was taking my notes. This is probably 10 or 12 years ago. I'm taking my notes on this digital device. I was listening and I was noting what she was saying. And because the expectation or the normal like walking around curb knowledge was, well, if this guy is on a device, he's not paying attention to anything I'm saying. So being specific about having that conversation in terms of what it is I'm actually doing was a game changer. When I actually flipped the screen up and showed her what was going on, it was like, oh, my gosh, he's, he's listening to, what, to what's going on. Uh, so sometimes I think that's an easy place to have miscommunication. We, we, can make, we, we tend to assume the worst in some of those situations. And sometimes it's just a matter of helping a kid. I remember uh, one of the suggestions I had for kids that had trouble writing. This was back when teachers would still mostly write their homework assignments on the board. Take a picture of it. And while kids were having success, some teachers got very upset. Like, what are you doing? Put that away. That's not what we're doing now. We're not using, you know, or why do you have your phone? Or, and simply by saying, wait, one of the things that I struggle with is remembering what the homework is and getting into my agenda book. I take a picture. It's like, oh, Wow, you're you're interested in doing your homework. So, you know, talking about our intentions and and explaining what we're doing. In some ways, it, it sounds so simple, but it, it can't be an overlooked step because it'll just lead to real real miscommunication. 
intentionality is a huge thing, right? What is your intention? What is your purpose? What are you doing? And then the next part is your communication, how you're opening up and what you're saying to the families or individuals that are around you as, as an educator, but also for the kid and, and learning self-advocacy skills and learning some self-explanation skills. And you're right. I think some people jump to what's happening. What are they, what, what are they on their device for? And sometimes they're on TikTok and sometimes they're on something, but other times they could actually be trying to look up, you know, how they're right. You know, how many people have found themselves in a, in an argument where, you know, uh, my significant other doesn't need uh, Google because they're always right. You know, so it's like, you know, you can Google this now and actually get a better fight going. And, and I've seen people in live action in moments say, let me do a fact check on what you just said. You know, and it's, it's a great way to kind of engage and connect. So again, it doesn't have to be this technology is the worst thing ever. It's how we're talking about the intentionality. And the other word you said earlier is expectations. So that's great. It's good. There was one last question I was hoping to actually have that the uh, school folks kind of talk through just for a second. And I, of course, am having a hard time pulling up on my device. Um, so the last question was, um, you know what, I, I don't think this is for the teachers, but you guys can talk through it. As educators, you've seen this, you know, how to reduce the time for a 16 or 15 year old and a 17 year old. And, and one of the thoughts I want to say, even before I get to answer this question, is the difference between ages and the difference between is it a 15 year old that's really mature or is it a 15 year old that's not really mature? Is it a 17 year old that's really mature or is it a 17 year old that where are they at developmental? So I don't get stuck on specific ages or middle school or by junior year, they should have an X relationship with this device. It's more about where they're at in life, how they're conducting themselves. And, and both of all you guys said, it's the behavioral relationship with it. That's the thing we need to identify with them. What are they doing? So I need to have you guys as a family start to take inventory and saying, I'm concerned when you're on your device at 10 o'clock at night. I'm concerned when you don't look up from the the device and we're trying to have family dinner. I worry if you're doing this here, are you doing this in other places? So be specific in some of your written out concerns, start to track what things, because if you blanket my 15 year old, my 17 year old, this is how I'm gonna treat the house. You can do cultural norms for the entire house, the culture for the school, but the specifics of concern, you don't wanna blanket statement, you wanna be more uh, clear in your language, I guess. And I just want to ask the educators in, in, on, does that make sense? Would, would, you, would you guys want to talk about the developmental stages or middle school versus high school with technology? I'm sorry I didn't prep you guys for that question. You don't have to answer. It's okay. I can chime in a little related, maybe a little off topic on it. So I completely agree with what you're saying, more setting um, boundaries and expectations and having conversations with kids about um, what they're doing on their device versus the amount of time that they're on the device. And I just wanted to kind of put out there um, in working with middle school and high school students, we're really talking, you know, about brain development and, and molding and modeling for them to become young adults. And um, I think it's really important to talk about with kids, um, what they're actually seeing on social media and when they're on their devices, um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, people post their like happy moments, right? And their busy moments. And I'm out doing this. I'm out with this person doing this. And I feel like the kids then get this expectation that all of their peers' lives are better than theirs. Um, but I think it's, I would say it's less about limiting the time and more about really having conversations about what they're seeing, because I do think that it, um, the more time that they spend on the device and they see all of these great stories and activities that their friends are posting, I think it makes them feel more isolated and less valuable or less valued than their friends. So I think that the focus is more about um, having the conversations about the content and reality versus, you know, our cyber life that we um that we show others. That is huge. And I don't, I didn't bring that up tonight, comparing your insides to other people's outsides, you know, because Facebook or social media, it's not a true representation of all reality. No one's posting. I stayed in on a Friday night and ate frozen yogurt with my mom. No one's posting a perfect image of how they, you know, went somewhere or stayed home and they're really happy about they didn't go to the park. Everyone's posting that perfect image of, 
uh, uh, an image over a red cup, for instance. So they're posting the, the perfect picture. They're taking 20 pictures. And then is that a true representation of what's really happening? I worked with a local high school where the, the kids were at a party and the kids started scrolling through and he was at this big party and kids were hanging around and he's on his device because he's bored and he's scrolling through and he's looking and all of a sudden he realized, wow, that party looks really cool. That's happening on the live stream of somebody else's Instagram feed. And then all of a sudden he looked up and he goes, wait, there's Sally. Wait, Johnny, he was having FOMO for a party that he was at. Everybody went into the other room, took some videos, funny videos, and then they came back in and sat down and everybody was on their device. But he was having FOMO about trying to keep up with some, some social life. You know, and that's, that's the other thing too. We used to be up against the myth of a party last weekend. Did you hear about that party last weekend? Now we're up against that perfect image, but no one's posting how they felt about themselves at 8 a.m. No one's posting how they felt about themselves at 2 p.m. So thank you. Were you one of you guys going to say something? I'm sorry. That's okay. I was actually just going to say, I, I think you said it earlier, but FOMO means fear of missing out because I... I Many of us know that. I didn't know that one until recently. I have a lot of acronyms in my world, but I didn't know that one until recently. So if anybody else is like me and wondering what that is. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, the one thing that I was going to uh, toss in here around it, because I think there are mature youngers and there's immature or older. So I, I appreciate that. And obviously it, it, it plays in. I'm thinking about some of the kids who I saw spend a lot of time. So if I maybe if I move to a positive as opposed to someone who's in the world, like Liz just mentioned, it's huge, especially at that middle level. We were so insecure about our self-image generally through those years that that can really harm. But I think about some of the other kids who spent a lot of time on a device. And sometimes it was, and this, I'm, you're, you're hearing my bias in a positive way. Um, when we can create and use it as sort of like a stress relief piece, and I'm not talking about posting a, a TikTok video of your, you know, imaginary life that seems to be amazing and it's a it's a short moment, but I'm talking about more traditional creative writing, drawing, <clears throat> making music. When we let technology come sort of as a partner towards some of the things that we're passionate about that are healthy things. That's when I see like maybe a really nice relationship between a person and technology. It's kind of the balance I try to create. I can't say I have this all figured out because a lot of time I spend it being, you know, stressed out by the next incoming text message or the email that just never stops as, as we're in another meeting, we're getting an, another dose of things to catch up on. But I find that when technology works best for me, it's when I'm either connecting with family that's a little distant that I wouldn't normally see when I come home, my older kids, my parents, things like that. Or when I'm using it to sort of almost be a stress relief, almost fight the very things we're talking about by allowing it to come, come alongside me and allow me to do some things that I wouldn't normally do well. I can't draw stick figures are challenged for me, but I can edit some photos and I can put images together to represent something that is kind of relaxing and fun. Um, those kinds of things, if we can encourage the use of those things for a little more original, authentic, I don't even know what word to use, use the word digital dignity earlier around citizenship. And I like that. Just sort of help me be who I truly am, as opposed to trying to go after some kind of artificial image or pressure from what the, the perfect image looks like or what's being posted on social media. I think that would be healthy for our kids, for all of us. Thank you so much. That was great. I really do appreciate it. Kim, were you going to say something earlier? I just had a, a, a slightly different question for you guys. I wanted to share something with you that um, I'm going to share my screen for just a second. Um, but we have a, another program that we do called um, the Search for Identity. And this is uh, comes from a couple of different surveys that were done pretty recently asking high school students about their career choices or their career ambitions. And so two different surveys, one only listed 10, one listed the top five, but I've kind of highlighted here some, I guess we'll call them non-traditional career choices, but I would love to get your thoughts on this and any reactions that you have to this list. And I'm wondering if you're seeing this in your student population, any of these kinds of ambitions? I 
I can speak from a clinical perspective. Absolutely, we're seeing this, and absolutely, I'm worried about certain people aspiring to be. Don't get me wrong; uh, if they want to be artistic, like it was just mentioned, and do some stuff that's amazing. That's great, but if that's their sole intent or soul, it's kind of like the young person that just wants to be in film or video and may not know how to act, you know, and that kind of thing. So it's just looking at the complete picture, the complete person. And again, these are great things to have as outlets, but at what level, what cost, and what intentionality? I think one of the other folks were going to go. Sorry. I, I feel like I'm chatting a lot, but I, I can sort of remember a couple of years ago when I had a young student uh, tell me that they, when they grow up, they wanted to be a YouTube star. And I thought, wow, that is like, that is such a, a powerful piece of evidence of just how how uh, deeply embedded these things have become in our kids' lives. And um, part of it, I think, relates to what I was just saying. Now it is a little easier to make your own music because you don't need to have a studio in your home anymore. You just have a little studio on your device. So some of those things are positive pieces. But again, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure that as schools we're ready to equip kids. If, if a YouTube star is a legitimate career. Okay. And, and I guess I could, I could argue that it, yeah, it is. There are people who are doing this as a career. I'm not sure that our school systems are ready to change to embrace the fact that you can be a YouTuber, right? You can be a lawyer, you can be a doctor, you can be a social worker, you can be a teacher. Uh, you know, we, we tend to be slow to move. And I think more what it means, what I think about as an educator is I better be preparing kids with like more important soft skills, the creativity, the collaborative skills, the communication, the conversation, the critical thinking. I better, I better do my best to create systems where we give them those skills because who knows what jobs will be 10 years from now. There's going to be some that we haven't even thought of. So for me, it's a two-edged sword. I don't want them getting swirled up in something that maybe is not a great life goal. But I also want to acknowledge that, hey, there are things that are going to emerge as legitimate careers for our kids post-high school, post-secondary that we don't even know about. So for me, that's always a challenging one, but it, it, it's kind of exciting to me because who knows what that will emerge for. And I, I like the idea of trying to prepare kids to thrive in whatever that next step looks like. Dave, I think you bring up a really good point. And I think sometimes we have a lot to learn from our kids uh, because while, while YouTube um, may not sound like a great career choice to, to many of those in our generations, our kids know that the jobs that they're being prepared for might not even exist. So when we're talking about more traditional things that you know, we were encouraged to do when, when we were kids and contemplating our adult experiences and where life would take us, I think to some degree, they know that there are going to be new jobs out there that are more relevant to them. So while maybe it is, you know, YouTuber or, or a social, social media star, uh, I, I think there are some things and we can, we can, we can take some of these lessons from our kids that they are very likely being prepared, many of them for things that we haven't even clearly defined yet. Dang. A positive one in that regard is a big data engineer. There was no such thing as a big data engineer probably 10 years ago. But now people wouldn't necessarily look at that in the same way they might turn their nose down to being, say, a YouTube star. But yet it's similar in the sense that, wow, these are some of these are traditional skills that we'd have to we'd have to have in either case. But people look at something like a, a big data engineer as, wow, what a great emerging technology, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. These are evolving fields, but they don't necessarily feel the same way about some that are potentially more um, addictive or, or negative, uh, game development, YouTube star, et cetera. But there are, it's just part of the reality that, again, back to what Michael was sharing, we just have to have conversations about these things. Any of them could be potentially great careers and then he could just really pull you down in the, in a, in a terrible vacuum. That's hard to, hard to escape from. That was, that was pretty, uh, 
pretty severe there, but you get what you get the gist. Oh, hundred percent. And I, I tell people with this life uh, tech life balance, it's not a binary, all good, all bad. There's a lot of in between. There's a lot of gray and embracing the gray or embracing like not trying to be rigid with this, but to really kind of face it as a complexity, talk about it, really get their intentionality, get their expectations, hear what they're wanting to get from it. And if they're not getting what they want from it, it's, it's, it's a great conversational piece. And then if it's a career or something like that, what that could really look like, how that could really sound like, you know, because I don't know about you guys, but I wanted to be a rock star when I was 18, 19 years old. I wanted to paint houses when I was 22. I wanted to do a lot of things in my life and I've done some, but you know, it's great to dream, but it's like, is that matched by other things going on? I'm going to ask Kim or Bob, can you guys read this question? Somebody put in the chat, the local kids winning millions playing video games made it even tougher for us as parents. True story. You know, that idea is that like so many kids got, there was, there was one local kid that did kind of make it, make it really big. So now everybody's like, Oh, I I want to be that kid. And that's, yeah. Well, so can't the same be said for the NBA star and the rock star and a lot of other things. There are lots of rags to riches stories out there. Justin Bieber, you know, was on YouTube, right? And look where he landed. Yep. yep. And he was, we, yeah. We had, a student <laughs> win. We, we had a student win the world Fortnite tournament. I think maybe that's what that uh, is about. And I had an inter- interesting conversation with that student's father because the family felt a lot of pressure about, uh, you know, allowing their child the time that was necessary to reach that level of expertise, if you want to think about it that way, to reach that point. So it was an interesting dynamic to hear, uh, not only from the the student's perspective uh, about what they had done. And I mean, when you talk to him, he he really was on like a training regimen. He talked about the hand exercises and the and the stress relief and the carpal tunnel and the, you know, the, uh, the nutrition that he was engaging in and all this. So you think you're talking to an Olympic athlete. And then at the same time, the parents were sharing, you know, this has been difficult because people in the neighborhood, they're angry at us because we let our kids, we let our son play video games. So it, you know, there, again, there's just many, many levels. And I always forget this one, this one thing that that video game Fortnite the free version its first year that it came out made 1.8 B with a billion dollars. So I don't know if you know this, but once you get to certain levels in that game, you have to pay to play or you have to pay for skins or you have to pay for equipment or, or military equipment or whatever it is. And again, it's, it's just this like coin and and it's a little dissociative. So the kids don't really see the dollar. They just see the credit card attached. And it's just like three coins. What was that? $30. You know, and so the, they, that's how they made 1.8 B with a billion. But again, I, I don't want to throw it all on the bus like you guys talked about. Like certain kids were able to find it as a channel and like to see where that kid is today. And if he still has a relationship with, with technology, how easy with it. Some kids are able to renegotiate once they get it at a certain level. That's all. That's great. Well, this was awesome. I really can't thank the school folks enough. I threw you some difficult questions and I really can't thank you enough for jumping in and thank you for your participation. And Kim, as always, thanks for the opportunity for being part of the conversation. That monkey thing, she does read really well, like the, the monkey survey thing. So please take a second. They, we do listen, they do listen. So it's really important to get some feedback and hear about other great opportunities, get on their email list. It's actually a great, great amazing organization. So with that, I'll Turn it back to Kim. Thank you so much, Mike. Boy, you really hung in there not feeling well. We are so grateful to you. That was beautiful. Great job. And thank you so much to Dr. Ramage and Dr. Casito and to Liz Rakoff. Thank you very much. And thanks, Bob. Um, this was great. Yeah, as Mike said, Survey Monkey is going to be coming up for you. And we'd love to hear from you. So thank you again, all of you. Really appreciate this. And thanks for being here, everybody. Please stay safe. And we hope to see you again with Dr. Dalsgaard and also with our, have you had the conversation later on this year? Thank you so much, Kim and Michael and Bob. Appreciate you being with us. Thank you so much. Great, great, great opportunity. Good evening. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.